Okay, thank you everybody for joining this talk on uh, Post-Quantum Cryptography Alliance. Um, Professor Stibile, who sits here, gave a keynote today. Uh, so we'll try to take on a little bit more uh, details. And of course, we'll have some time co for questions, okay? Part of this is technical. Um, we are trying something interesting here. Uh, my expertise is not in quantum computing, even though I'm part of the IBM quantum team. That's not my background. But I will be giving that part of the talk. And <laughs> Hart, who's actually an expert in cryptography, is not doing that talk, so he just want to torture me. And he's going to do the part about the LF. But he'll help me. And uh, Douglas Sibila can also help me <laughs> if needed. So let me try this. All right, so here's the outline. The first part is essentially the quantum cryptography threat. So that's the part I'm going to try to, uh, to explain to you the best I can. And then uh, Hart will talk about the uh, cryptography, the PQCA, as we call it, the alliance, and some of the project details. Uh, so, and then we'll stop for questions. So that's kind of the outline. So let's get going. So first thing is, what is the threat? So the threat is actually interesting, is that and if you're here, you probably have heard of it, but there is a real threat that a sufficiently large enough quantum computer will pose threat to everybody here, to all of cryptography, right? So that's kind of the main uh, problem at hand. So let's kind of go deep into this and try to understand why that is, and also a little bit of background, I guess, to some extent on uh, quantum computing and complexity theory. So first thing is, why quantum, right? Like, what's, what's the big deal with quantum? So if you're into computer science, um, or if, you, if your background is computer science, you probably took a complexity theory class. And what's important to understand, if you're not, or if you, haven't, if you don't remember the details, is that while computing um, the basic Turing model that we all use right now uh, solves lots of problems, there are actual problems that you cannot really easily solve. Okay, or at least we don't know how to solve them in an easy fashion with the classical kind of computing. And what's interesting is there's a class of problem called the hard problems, so-called, or NP problem, non-polynomial uh, problems, where current classical computers uh, don't have efficient way of solving them. Now, there's heuristics. Uh, for instance, you've heard of traveling salesman problem where um, you have different cities, and you're trying to compute the most efficient way to go through the different cities. That's known to be hard, uh, a, a NP hard problem. And even other problems, like for instance, you have a circuit board that's, um, you know, is taking input just zeros and one. And if I gave you a sequence of strings of zeros and one, and I told you to decide, that's actually a very hard problem. Uh, it's it's NP hard as well. So satisfiability. Right? Uh, it doesn't mean you can't solve it. You just can't solve it at scale. You know, if, if you increase the number of input, the number of time, the number of computation increases as well. So what's, what's interesting about this is that there's also problems that are easy for quantum computers to solve that basically overlap the class of uh, NP-hard problems. And then, of course, there are problems outside of all of this. And Hurt likes to tell me that they call it MA, QMA for Merlin author, because there's a little bit of magic that basically happens. So why is that, right? Maybe that's the part that we should talk about. So what's, what's the big deal with quantum computing? You know? So it's hard to explain, but maybe I'll try the best that I can with this chart. And the explanation I'm going to give you is uh, for the layperson if you're an expert, you'll be like, oh, man, you're missing quite a bit. But I think it does enough to explain. OK, so let's do this. So first thing is, I talked about the fact that you build circuits to build computers, right? All computing that we do right now, uh, including this very fancy supercomputer in, in your pocket and mine, is essentially a collect collection of little gates. You know, And the gates are just turning switches. You know, They are switches, electronic switches. 
z was n1. Why is that? Is because we can basically convert all of information to sequence of z was n1. And then we can build little circuits to add those z was n1. So you can do adders. And then once you start doing adders, you can do multiplication because multiplication is just collection of adders. Division, same thing. And then everything else, right? So all of computing is just collection of these little circuits. And it's all z was n ones. The big difference in quantum computing is that you no longer deal with these bits, z was n one, you, 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 you're dealing with qubits. So what's a qubit? Um, difficult to explain, but best thing to, the best way to explain it is that it's essentially both zero and one. So it's a, it's a device, it can be uh, um, an electron, it can be actually molecules I've seen, but these things have both states, zeros and one. So if you imagine building circuits out of these um, qubits, then your circuit not only has a solution to the sequences of zero, one, zero, it has this, the, the solution to circuits that include zeros and one, zero and one, zero and one, and so on for each input, right? And it, it goes very fast if you have uh, these, these circuits. The problem, of course, is in quantum computing or in quantum, it's very hard to keep those states correctly. So if I had an adder that took these qubits, so in theory, with three of these uh, qubits, I would have solution to all of you know, zero, zero, one, one, and all of the combination of those three bits. But the problem is that any little perturbation, noise, creates errors, right? So in addition to having the qubits for the circuit, you need to have extra ones for error correction. So there's a little bit of that. The other thing also in, I guess, in quantum circuits, when you're building those things, is that even though you have a solution to the circuit, for all possibilities of input, um, you can't really read all of them. So you can really read one of them, okay, at a time. So essentially it goes into um, the fundamentals of, of, of quantum uh, mechanics where, you know, by observing uh, the particle, uh, so the qubit, you resolve its state. So it's, it's one of those uh, difficult things, but it also gets into maybe the most interesting part of quantum computing. And I think that's the part that, if you didn't know about this, it almost like, sounds like magic. And it's the fact that you can actually create these qubits, okay, as they are in superposition, so they're basically in all those possible states, but you can entangle them with other qubits. And when you entangle them, you can resolve the solution that you want with the entangled qubit. What does that mean? in practical sense. In practical sense is that if you had a qubit in your, you know, like a coin, and I had a coin also, so heads, tail, and we were entangled, if I flip it and I see head, and you flipped it, you would also see head. And it doesn't matter the distance, it doesn't matter um, basically, uh, you know, uh, any uh, di differences physically, the entanglement of those two qubit means that you can resolve it. So when you think of superposition, so qubits that can be in all states, and then the fact that you can entangle, then you can actually start solving real problems. So that's in a very, you know, iffy fashion, the, the way to explain the big difference between the regular uh, classical uh, computers to these new quantum computers that use qubits and the fact that you now have also these additional state of matter that you're dealing with to force solutions that you want, okay? So what does that matter, right? So that's the first thing, is that now we have these qubits. Why, why is this interesting? Because we can't even build very large quantum computers. Well, it matters because people over time have started developing algorithms with these imaginary quantum computers, okay? Even though we could build like, let's say, two or three qubit quantum computers, uh, you could imagine having a much bigger one and even simulate them and solve a uh, much uh, interesting problem. So one of the problems that people have come up with, uh, or at the solution to problem, is uh, Shor's algorithm. So what's interesting is that Shor's 
discovered this um, 30 years ago at Berkeley. And it still holds true, and people still have tested it. So it's, uh, it's pretty much uh, proven and have lots of implementation and simulation and so on. Okay. But the basic reason why this is uh, interesting, uh, Shor's algorithm, and there's other algorithms that are also interesting, is that if you try to factor numbers, that's one of the hard problems that you know we talked about. It's a seems like a very simple problem, but it's actually quite hard. So if I give you a number and I tell you to figure out the two original factors of that number, especially if those original factors are prime, it gets increasingly hard as the number is is large. So you could you know you teach little kids how to multiply, and you tell them, okay, I give you the multiplied number, figure out the original two numbers that gave you the the, the, the total, that's actually an extremely hard problem. And that's basically what Shor's algorithm solves. The best known uh, solution to uh, factoring is number sieve, field sieve. And the complexity of it is exponent to uh, D, which is how large that number is, you know, like how many digits you represent it. And uh, right now, the best record that we have is about 230 digits. So D is 230. So what does that mean to have E to 230? Right? It seems like pretty straightforward. We could just all write it, right? 2 to the 230 or E, which is 2.8, right? Any number to 230. That's more atoms than the known observable universe. So 202 to 230. That's how big that is, OK? With Shor's algorithm, you pretty much get a flat line. So it's a constant times d, 230, to, to the third. So it's a very, it's a significantly less number of operations to essentially factor numbers, OK? So why does that matter, being able to factor numbers very fast? Well, it matters because Cryptography, as we know it today, or at least uh, classical cryptography maybe, is uh, essentially factoring numbers. Right? The fundamental problems. There's other ways to, to do a little bit more decent cryptography, but essentially that's what it is. So RSA, um, pretty much everything that you are using on your phone right now when you connect to, um, to any website, hopefully, or to your bank, you're encrypting the data that's essentially going to algorithms that are based on uh, factorization. So why is it at risk? Well, because once we have a large enough quantum computer, um, we'll be able to decrypt all of that data. So there was a paper, I think a couple of years ago, maybe last year, where people claimed that they were able to decrypt WhatsApp messages. And WhatsApp messages is known to be uh, all encrypted with better than 1024 bit encryption, and they showed that, right? So why do you care? Why should you care? You should care because a lot of your data is not necessarily just uh, for today. You want, it for, you want it to be safe for tomorrow. So examples are financial data. I mean, I don't think any of you here would want any of your financial data to be visible you know, even after you die, you die uh, you'd still want it to be somewhat private. Imagine banks, companies that, you know, last a long time. Imagine if you're a um, government, you have data that are secret uh, that you do not want uh, to share uh, at any point in time today or in the near future. So what can happen and what we believe is happening right now is that if, um, if there's data that's very secretive, um, the risk of harvest now and decrypt later, so in other words, you keep that data, you store it, encrypted, and then once we have access to a large enough quantum computer, then you can decrypt it. And all of a sudden, you can make all of that information public or use it to make um, you know, all kinds of threats and so on. So the, the, the threat, of uh, the possibility is real. And people started realizing this uh, years ago. 
But what's more interesting is that we've had solutions, okay? And if you ask experts when in the future do you believe that there will be a large enough quantum computer, most people kind of disagree, uh, agree that 15 years. So just to give you a little bit of, of detail without you know, uh, necessarily trying to advertise, at IBM we have 137, I think, bit uh, quantum computer. If you ever go to New York, you can go see it. Um, and that quantum computer has all logical qubits, so it means that those 127 are all logical qubits, so you can put them in superposition and so on. Um, we announced the release of a 1,000 qubit uh, quantum computer by the end of the year because the model that we have right now is, is stackable. Our competitors are even announcing bigger uh, you know, quantum computers. So Microsoft, if you Google that, has announced, I don't know if anybody here is from Microsoft, but they've announced, ah, there you go. <laughs> I don't know if you're part of the quantum team, but they announced a partnership with Continuum and the I think it's a 10,000 qubit uh, quantum computer at the end of the year. So the, the, the trajectory of how big those quantum computer is, is increasing. So this 15 years timeline is actually getting closer to today, okay? Now, obviously, you'd have to have access to a quantum computer like this. You'd have to, there's a lot of ifs, but you know how um, AI 10 years ago if you ask anybody here, they'd be like, oh man, ah, my, I will, I'll be dead before I see AI that I worry about. If I ask you right now, you all worry about AI today. So this is just to say, I'm not saying that quantum will go at the same pace as AI, but I think technology has a way of going fast and reaching those knee and increasing. And if anything, uh, quantum technology will also reach the same, or at least some pattern like that. So what have people have started doing? Okay, this is my last two minutes and then I'll switch it to Kurt and he can also correct all my mistakes <laughs> because he knows more about this than me. So the last thing to mention is what have people done? So as I mentioned, classical cryptography is based on number theory. So people looked at what could we do that is better or, or like a different uh, way of encrypting data. And people have looked at um, the mathematics of lattice, okay? It's not very complicated, but it's maybe um, more complicated than I can do in two minutes. But suffice it to say that there is new algorithms that are based on this completely different branch of math than the branch where factorization of number or number theory is. And we've solved, we've found problems that are easy in one direction and hard in the other direction, which is basically what you need to do encryption. And the problem is basically combination of vectors to join two points. So if you know those two initial vectors, it's super easy to find the connection of two points in the lattice. But if you have to guess the vectors, then it becomes extremely hard, especially because in Lattice, the math is you can uh, scale it to any number of dimensions. So usually you think, okay, you build a simple Lattice that's flat, two dimensions, so two vectors, you're connecting two points, so you're guessing. But if you start looking at the math, it can go to a thousand dimension. So it becomes super, super hard, even for quantum computing. Now, of course, there's always a watch out. Uh, there's a paper recently that is posing a threat even to that. So uh, just be aware. <laughs> so, everybody's worried about it. And uh, we at IBM are looking at that paper right now. So anyhow. So if you're interested, actually, in uh, post-quantum cryptography, uh, First thing I'd say is take a class with Professor Stibila and you'll learn from the expert. But if you can't, go to University of Waterloo or even online, then you can log into IBM Quantum Learning and we have a free class and you can actually get a badge after this. I don't think it does justice to people like uh, uh, Douglas's talk, uh, uh, classes uh, and other experts, but it's certainly something and it's free. 
Okay, so you can take it for free. Um, so quantum learning and just look for a practical introduction of quantum cryptography. So last thing I'll mention, I'll pass it to Hort, is that all of this effort around getting better cryptography or what we call post-quantum cryptography, it, it's been a industry worldwide effort, right? The National Institute of Standardization, NIST, uh, Standards in Technology, NIST, put a call of action almost 10 years ago and tons of researchers have contributed uh, algorithms and it went through all kinds of competition. So this is all the experts and we are at a phase right now where the new algorithms are being released. There is implementation of these algorithms uh, for all languages, uh, including Rust, if that's your favorite language these days. So those exist. And of course, even people like, uh, I keep pointing at Douglas because he uh, had a research project at University of Waterloo to integrate uh, post-quantum cryptography into our system, so things like Linux. So this is where PQCA enters, and I'll pass it to Hart, who can take it from there. Awesome. So, Thanks a lot, Max. Sure, no problem. I'm always excited when a quantum complexity theory slide <laughs> makes it into a business talk. Um, so always happy to see that. So yeah, so Max has done an excellent job of laying out the problem. Why are we here today? Why do we care about post-quantum cryptography? You know, um, I hope you all understand that and I hope that's, that's obvious. And the important thing now is we need to have solutions that will let us deal with this threat, right? Ideally open source, open development solutions that anyone can come and use to solve their post-quantum cryptography problems. And so this is why we created the Post-Quantum Cryptography Alliance um, at the Linux Foundation. And the idea is we want to advance the adoption of post-quantum cryptography by providing high quality implementations um, and also supporting the continued development and standardization of new post-quantum algorithms uh, with software and, and prototyping and all of that. Has anyone here followed the NIST competition for post-quantum cryptography? Yeah, I know some of you obviously have, but um, you know, as you know, there's, there's still exciting stuff coming on, right? You know, um, maybe you're interested in isogenies. Who's familiar with elliptic curve isogenies? Uh, Douglas, okay. Um, yeah, so, you know, well, they offer the potential for really small signatures, which might be very nice in some applications. Um, so, What's really interesting about the PQCA is it does have a very strong connection to the research community, uh, which a lot of other LF projects don't. Um, but fundamentally, you know, we're just another uh, LF project umbrella. You know, if you've seen the CNCF or Hyperledger or the Open Wallet Foundation, you know, it's all basically the same community. And I assume you're here. Uh, so most people here probably know how Linux Foundation projects work at a high level. And we aim to, you know, follow in, in that ideal of the excellent projects that have gone before us. Um, so some initial projects. Um, I'll go into a little bit of detail on these and, and maybe some more detail later. And I should probably drag Douglas up on stage to, uh, you know, answer specific questions about some of these. Um, uh, but the Initial core of the PQCA uh, was contributed by, uh, you know, Douglas and Michelle Mosca um, from the University of Waterloo, um, and it had sort of three main subprojects: uh, LibOQS, uh, some demos, uh, and an SSL provider. Um, so these implemented a number of post-quantum algorithms uh, and some other things like hybrid algorithms. Are people here familiar with, with hybrid algorithms? Maybe not. So the basic idea here is we don't know when quantum computing is going to come. And we don't necessarily have as much confidence in some of these new post-quantum crypto standards, right? Because they're very new um, as, you know, like RSA or, or ECDSA or some of these old elliptic curve standards, right? And so the idea is if you want to maximize security and you don't really care about performance, you can do both at the same time. And so that's what people refer to when they say like a hybrid CAM or a hybrid signature scheme. It's used both at the same time 
and you get the security guarantees of both if you've used them in a constructive way. Um, so we also have uh, a brand new project uh, that we have called the PQ code package, and I hope we will find a, a better name for that eventually. Um, but this has a number of different uh, high assurance uh, production source codes uh, and some wrappers as well. Um, we're anticipating a number of other projects coming in as well. Uh, maybe some Rust cryptography, uh, maybe some post-quantum zero-knowledge proofs. Uh, if anyone here is familiar, who's familiar with zero-knowledge proofs? Oh, great, great. Um, so, you know, obviously for long-term things, you know, where data is going to be around a long time, like blockchain, um, having either, you know, perfectly hiding or, or post-quantum zero-knowledge proofs is really important. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're excited to see more contributions in the future. And I do want to point out this boundary between sort of, you know, production track and experimental track. So we do want to make sure that we have, you know, a pipeline, if you will, from, you know, research and, you know, best standards all the way to practice. And that's what we aim to, to implement with the PQCA. Um, so I just commented about this a little bit, um, you know, we are working through all the delineations. We're a very new project. Um, we just got started in February, uh, but we will focus on both production um, and experimental research. So a bit more about the uh, OQS project. If you have any questions or you wanna get involved, I'd definitely encourage you to talk to uh, Douglas. Um, but you know this has some exciting connections to OpenSSL, which I assume most people here are familiar with, um, and it's our hope that we can use Open Quantum Safe to help uh, bring quantum security to OpenSSL. Um, some folks who are involved, um, you know, lots of people, lots of folks from companies in the audience, um, and again, if you're interested in getting involved with any of these projects or companies please feel free to reach out. We aim to be a very welcoming and inclusive and open community. Um, you know, we are really just putting together this project called the PQ Code Package. Um, you know, right now they're uh, mostly focusing on Kyber or ML Chem. Uh, we obviously can't name projects after uh, Disney properties, um, which unfortunately a lot of cryptographers uh, seem to uh, not realize, um, but uh, yeah, so so if, you know, um, Matthias Kunzweiser is one of the, the core people here, as well as uh, Nigel and some others, um, but yes, we're, we're moving forward on this, and um, we really hope to get some good uh, Rust contributions in this. And then again, you know, more projects, your project here. If you have a project that you're working on in post-quantum cryptography, um, you know, we'd love it if you could potentially contribute. Um, right now we have, you know, maintainers and contributors working on a lot of possible use cases, you know, but there are many others which we probably don't. For instance, you know, if you have a particular IoT case that requires uh, low power or small signatures or something like that. Um, so who's familiar with how a Linux Foundation project is, is governed here? Most people, some people, right? Um, so, you know, we have uh, standard best practices of the Linux Foundation for project governance. And what I always like to emphasize about LF governance is that uh, individual projects are organized with their own governance and technical participation is completely open. You don't have to be a member of anything to participate at a technical level. All of our meetings, mailing lists, uh, Discord, because developers these days hate mailing lists and like Discord, um, it's all completely open. You can lurk, you can join, and we encourage you to participate. Um, and so on that note, yeah, I'll just uh, list our ways to get involved. Uh, this would be more useful uh, if you had the actual slide links or a QR code, uh, but I will make the slides available. And um, on that note, I'd like to conclude and uh, leave some time for questions if folks have any.
Any questions? No. Can you elucidate us? Uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to go back to my notes and look, and look, uh, look it up, but I think it's a model, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. What, what I know is there's, there's a collection of startups that are uh, trying different ways, like Iron Q and a few others, and then there's also the big companies. Um, Microsoft has a partnership, as I mentioned, Continuum, you can look it up. Google has internal uh, quantum computers that they're doing, and then we have one uh, for the longest time. As a matter of fact, I didn't invite any of you. If you are in New York, you can go see it. Uh, contact me and I'll connect you. Um, so yeah, so that exists, but I don't know of any government funded or any kind of like, yeah. No, I don't. David has the next question, but before he asks, I'll comment and say that. Did you know? Uh, from my perspective, most of the development that is known on big quantum computers is coming from these big companies and startups. Uh, the interesting factor that can't be discounted is we don't know what a lot of nation states are doing in yes. secret. Uh, and you yeah. know, there's a large potential that a couple of them could be ahead of what the industry is doing. Yeah. When, when the industry builds a quantum computer, they're gonna want it to solve business problems. They're gonna tell everybody. If yeah. IBM can factor with Shor's algorithm, they can factor our say 2048, you better believe you know everybody's going to know, um, yeah. but you know if, if a nation state can, we don't know. Maybe they already can. So, David. Uh, yeah, I would comment on that. Although, if, if you're a nation, big nation state and you're not doing this, I don't know what's wrong with you. Probably somebody's going to be fired. Um, but, but that was what I was going to say. Um, so I worked at the OpenSSF. Among other things, in the uh, course that we have on how to develop secure software, we specifically hey, quantum computing has a very good chance of coming, you should be prepared, you should be prepared to use hybrid. What other things can be done to alert? Because I don't think a lot of software developers have any clue that this is a potential opportunity. But I think a lot of developers, crypto's a mystery, you just put bits in and magic happens, and they're unaware that this is a potential reality. That's a great question. And my favorite answer to this is that I think developers should develop with crypto agile yes. solutions. So, you know, don't hard code SHA, don't hard code ECDSA, please don't hard code RSA into your software anywhere. Use generic wrappers, use generic interfaces, preferably ones that make it easy to update keys and even schemes. Uh, and that way, your developers don't have to know you know, exactly what they're dealing with, right? You know, you can say, use this generic, like, you know, signer functionality or signer crate or whatever your favorite programming language calls it. Um, and then, you know, when you do want to update, you can do some kind of like backend update or, or some build update that doesn't require you to go through your, you know, code and strip out every instance of ECDSA because yeah. for some reason you've hard coded it in there and you've made your, your crypto migration an absolute nightmare. I think we have a question in the back, but I'll, I'll mention that I've learned in 25 years of computing, you probably heard this before, every solution to computer science problems is indirection. Create an indirection and you solve it. Yeah. Yes. Oh, 100%, absolutely. There's a whole process, best practices. Around. Probably have time for a couple more questions. Ah, please. For someone who's working on the first one, crypto software, what kind of support can they get from ECA? Well, just like every organization, right, in the Linux Foundation, what I would say is uh, whatever you're working on, join the calls. So we have working groups. So if your contribution is closer to what the OQS project does, then I would join the calls, uh, Douglas runs it, and then in there you would find other people there that are contributing to OQS, see if what you have is a extension or contribution that can be in OQS, 
if it's something completely different, like let's say an implementation of some of the Kyber algorithms in a different language, then you can join the PQ code package because that's where we're gonna start collecting some of those. Uh, so basically reach out to me or to Hart or to Douglas, anybody in the, in the PQCA. Um, and you know, basically we have a GitHub uh, organization, projects can be there. Uh, we'll try to, we're looking at supporting, um, you know, having a workshop so we can get together. Um, there is also talk about uh, sponsoring uh, students. So there's lots of discussion. So just join, it's, it's an early stage where you can actually join and, and, and you know, contribute more than code, contribute also leadership and, and opinions and so on. Financial support. So the different companies founded the foundation. So there's, uh, there's a budget, but we don't pay the contributors. Just like Kubernetes, if you contribute to Kubernetes, you don't get paid, right? You have to have your own, uh, I guess, uh, uh, hiring company. Uh, but uh, we can we can talk. We're always hiring. Any other question? Last minute question. Hopefully we didn't scare you. We made it. <laughs> oh, we should scare you, but also give you a solution. So that's the key thing. Thank you. Yeah, it will be you. around. Yeah, we'll be around. So if you all have any more questions, you know, please feel free to ask.